the South China Sea uh, is an area of particular interest um, internationally and regionally at the moment. I'm sure you're all very aware, but it is um, currently disputed between six different governments uh, directly over the islands within the sea and by extension the waters around those islands. Um, and indirectly there is an overlap between a Chinese claim to maritime um, sovereignty or maritime territorial waters and uh, Indonesia's EEZ uh, near Natuna Island. So this is a very complex multilateral um, dispute that we have in the South China Sea that's uh, recently become much more uh, intense um, owing to a variety of different factors. You'll also be aware that we've seen a growing intensity in other maritime disputes in Asia, particularly around the East China Sea recently between China and Japan, um, but also uh, in the uh, Dokdo Takashima Islands between South Korea and Japan, the northern limit line between the two Koreas, uh, even Iodo Islands between South, South Korea and China. I think um, there are reasons why all of the Asian maritime disputes are now much more uh, intense than they have been in the past. The first is, uh, obviously, the economic growth of the region has increased the importance of overseas trade and maritime interests generally. Um, countries such as China, where previously they may have been self-sustaining uh, and self-sufficient in various areas of food and energy, now, now have to rely on overseas trade to supply those demands. Um, an increasing need of resources uh, from these energy-hungry countries means they're con constantly seeking other and secure supplies of hydrocarbons um, and also food supplies uh, from overseas. And if they can find them, those in waters to which they have exclusive sovereign rights, um, then all the better for them for security. Uh, equally, since the Second World War, um, various countries in East Asia have suffered from instabilities domestically. Uh, if we look at Vietnam, for instance, which went through a cycle of three very intense wars uh, within 30 years, China has had uh, periods of instability through the Cultural Revolution, through the Great Leap Forward, uh, through the Gang of Four as well. Uh, those situations are, to some extent, resolving themselves, uh, and so the countries are turning their attention away from the domestic instabilities towards their peripheries, which is where we find these maritime interests. Uh, more esoterically, there's something of a return to the sea from these countries. Um, Asia has always been a very maritime region, um, but countries such as China have always had this uh, difficult decision to make between its continentalism, uh, its land-based interests, and uh, its maritime focus. And over the last 60 to 70 years, certainly, and also during the Qing dynasty, um, it was very land-focused. Uh, in the Qing dynasty, it was, in fact, uh, overtly uh, focused on the land and, and banned many uh, forms of naval or maritime expeditions. Uh, but now these countries are returning to the sea um, and seeing their interest in the sea um, through a different light. And finally, one factor uh, certainly affecting all of these uh, disputes is the rise of China, which is shaking up the regional order and has uh, a variety of effects on how countries are dealing with each other and their perceptions of threat. With all these factors um, affecting uh, international relations in uh, East Asia, the South China Sea is something of a crucible um, for these international relations and is really reflective of how the regional order is changing. Um, it's important for a variety of different reasons. It's a major uh, thoroughfare for maritime trade. Over half of the world's merchant fleet tonnage every year will go through the South China Sea. And that's not important only for the East Asian countries, but um, about 20% of the more than $5 trillion in trade that goes through the South China Sea is U.S. commerce as well. So there's obviously extra regional interests in the South China Sea. Uh, it's very important for resources. Uh, we all know about oil and gas, and China claims somewhat uh, unbelievably, but still claims there may be more than 200 billion barrels of oil in the sea. Uh, other um, estimates are much more uh, conservative, um, but nonetheless there are some hydrocarbons in there that could be useful for the littoral countries. Uh, fisheries is also very important and often overlooked. Um, there are perhaps several million people who are directly employed in the fisheries industry uh, around the South China Sea, and it's an important source of nutrients for uh, large populations in Southeast Asia. And finally, there's a military strategic aspect, which while the very small islands in the South China Sea are not necessarily of any military utility themselves because they're so small, um, the South China Sea is very important for countries such as China, which currently is hemmed in um, to its east by Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, and those chains of islands there. And so sees the South China Sea as probably the main route it has to the open ocean through the Luzon Strait. It's for this reason that it's building a major base on uh, the south coast of Hainan Island on the South China Sea, and within that base uh, will likely be its future nuclear ballistic missile submarine fleet, which will then be able to easily transition towards the open ocean in the Pacific through the South China Sea. So the South China Sea is certainly of um, strategic utility and importance, uh, not just for the countries in the region but elsewhere. The question is why has it become more uh, intense and contested over recent years? 
most uh, countries and most academics would argue it's because of uh, Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea. And this is a, a phrase that gets used quite a lot, the assertiveness of China, ever since 2008 or 2009. A variety of different incidents uh, seem to suggest this assertiveness uh, was to blame. The USNS Impeccable, which is a US um, uh, civilian manned naval ship, uh, surveillance ship, was harassed by Chinese vessels in 2009, um, which immediately alerted uh, the US to the possibilities of uh, difficulties in freedom of navigation in the area. It wasn't the first such instance, but it was certainly the most direct um, challenge to that principle. Uh, Vietnam and the Philippines have both complained that Chinese uh, civilian and maritime paramilitary vessels have tried to cut survey cables towed behind their uh, exploration ships that are uh, hired by their national oil companies. Uh, and earlier this year, we saw a standoff um, lasting several weeks between the Philippines and China over Scarborough Reef, which is uh, an almost entirely submerged reef with only a few rocks uh, jutting out from above the sea uh, at low tide. So um, that particular uh, standoff involved maritime paramilitaries in, in the beginning, a Philippine warship um, hovering close to each other in a relatively tense standoff, uh, and the coercive economic diplomacy of the banning of bananas, which is probably the first time we've ever seen coercive banana diplomacy um, as a phrase in international relations. Now, China would suggest that it's not being assertive. It is, in fact, being reactive, um, and there is something to that argument. Vietnam and the Philippines have been much more forthright in their exploration of hydrocarbons in the South China Sea in recent years. Uh, and China sees this as a challenge to its um, position. It doesn't like to see a change in the status quo in these disputes because it suggests that uh, reactions are necessary. Um, this reactiveness or reactive assertiveness um, is a very debatable point, um, but I think we can certainly say that China is a lot more confident in its diplomacy in the South China Sea, um, whether or not you state its assertiveness. This, in turn, has led to um, reactions from other states as well, uh, Southeast Asian as well as the US. Um, and those reactions are often in uh, response to the perceived military rise of China. And it's the, um, the rapid development of China's military, particularly its navy, and the opacity of its military that is a concern to various states, both in the region and beyond. Uh, if we see this year, for instance, China has developed a new relatively advanced destroyer, the Type 52D. Um, which uh, will, for the first time, probably be deployed with navalized land attack cruise missiles. Land attack cruise missiles are necessarily an offensive weapon. Uh, you don't need cruise missiles to attack someone else's land unless you are attacking them. Uh, previously, China had only really had navalized anti-ship missiles rather than land attack cruise missiles. Uh, various other aspects, the air aircraft carrier being commissioned this year, which is seen as a very um, emotional uh, and uh, significant development in China's Navy, although the aircraft carrier itself is not a very significant asset um, given its age and its relatively limited capability, but it is the start of an aircraft carrier fleet that China will be uh, developing over recent years. So in response to this military development, and those are just two examples of a much broader full-spectrum development of China's military, uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, have been also engaging in relatively rapid military procurement. This has, uh, in turn, incited fears of an arms race in the region. I would argue that um, we're not seeing uh, an arms race per se, but we are certainly seeing military competition. Uh, one of the aspects that people often refer to is the uh, procurement of submarines in the region. Vietnam has signed a contract for six kilo-class submarines, which will be its first um, conventional uh, non-coastal submarines uh, ever deployed. Um, the Philippines has received two uh, cutters from the uh, US, which, uh, the, one of which is now its, its flagship which is really a sign of the paucity of Philippine capabilities rather than um, anything else. Malaysia and Singapore have recently bought new submarines as well. Uh, Indonesia has launched a contract um, and signed a deal with South Korea to buy three Type 209s. Um, so there is a strange uh, rash of submarine purchases throughout the region. Um, the fact that these submarines are being purchased is largely a reflection of the fact that Southeast Asian countries can no longer compete with China on the surface of the water, and so they're turning to that ultimate sea denial weapon, the submarine. Submarines are, ton for ton, the most expensive naval vessel you can buy, but they are also a great force multiplier. Just one submarine in the water <coughs> can deny large areas of the sea um, to an opponent, and given their necessary clandestine nature, they see, sow seeds of doubt into a rival relatively easily. The reasons for the purchase of submarines are varied. Vietnam, I think, is clearly purchasing submarines to um, uh, compete with China's growing uh, naval hegemony within the region. But Malaysia's purchase of submarines are less clear-cut. Uh, 
Uh, arguably, um, and I would argue this, Malaysia has purchased submarines because of its traditional rivalry with Singapore rather than any concern about Chinese <coughs> capabilities. Um, and also it's uh, uh, potentially arguable that these navies are simply developing uh, full spectrum of capabilities as their economies also develop. These sub-regional d- dynamics between countries such as Malaysia and Singapore, uh, on the one hand, or Singapore and Indonesia, um, suggests that while we may not be seeing a regional arms race, what we are seeing is a very complex, multilateral, interwoven series of military competitions that is changing the tenor of military procurement uh, in the region. We've also seen some diplomatic reactions from Southeast Asia, uh, in particular countries such as Vietnam and the Philippines, attempting a a unified diplomacy um, from Southeast Asia through ASEAN uh, towards China in these disputes. More recently, we've seen uh, some failures in that attempt at unified diplomacy, um, particularly with the failure of ASEAN to uh, issue a a communique at the end of its foreign ministers' meeting in July for the first time in its uh, more than four decades' history. Uh, And at the recent meeting um, in November in Cambodia, there was an open spat between the Cambodian Prime Minister and the Philippine President over the involvement of the US in the South China Sea dispute. So uh, while ASEAN is... uh, an organisation that thrives on the rhetoric of consensus uh, and um, community. Um, In reality, there are many tensions behind the scenes uh, between the ASEAN states. Uh, They've also tried to, Southeast Asian countries, and in particular Vietnam and the Philippines, have tried to internationalise the issue by encouraging greater US engagement in the region, um, but also uh, engagement from countries such as Russia, India and Japan. They've done it through a variety of different ways. Vietnam has started to build closer defence links with the US, um, which is uh, a relatively startling development given how antagonistic they were towards each other in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, uh, Vietnam has also opened up Camran Bay, which is a former Soviet and US naval base um, in the east of the country, to um, uh, international ship repairs. So the US has now sent several ships to be repaired there uh, for the first time uh, since the Vietnam War. Um, This engagement to the U.S. has borne fruit, uh, as we've seen with the U.S. pivot, which, although um, some would argue has been going on for several years, was most clearly elucidated uh, in late 2011 by Hillary Clinton in an article in in a foreign policy magazine, and then uh, very specifically elucidated by President Obama and Defense Secretary Panetta in January um, when they launched a new strategy, which suggested that the U.S. would, of necessity, pivot towards Asia. They've since dropped the word pivot. It's not really um, amenable to their demands. The U.S. diplomats often have um, uh, a tendency to use sporting metaphor uh, whenever they talk about international relations, and sometimes it's lost on international audiences because they're American sports, um, which, as we see in their World Series, don't really include other countries. But also, <laughs> um, the idea of a pivot is necessary temporary, uh, and that's why they've stopped talking about a pivot and now talk about a rebalance. Um, there are three real arms to this, this, this rebalance. There's a diplomatic arm where um, the US is uh, aiming to show up a lot more at uh, regional um, conferences, and we'll note that the first overseas visit by President Obama after its re-election was to Southeast Asia. There's an economic rebalance, um, particularly through the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a a regional economic cooperation agreement that the US is trying to develop. But what's caught most people's eye is the so-called military rebalance, uh, or pivot, um, which has uh, thus far included the deployment of up to 2,500 Marines to Darwin and Australia on a rotational six-month basis, um, and also in the future up to four littoral combat ships being based in, um, well, being deployed to, but not based in Singapore. Um, In reality, the military rebalance is very modest uh, in the amount of capabilities that it will send to Asia, and is partially um, simply rebalancing after drawing those capabilities away from Asia to the Middle East to fight wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, Beyond the littoral combat ship and and Darwin, there isn't really much of note in terms of an increase in offensive military capabilities. There is, however, a rebalance within the region, um, if not so much a rebalance to the region. 9,000 Marines are being moved from Okinawa in Japan to uh, Guam, Hawaii, and Australia. Um, And this is being done in conjunction with um, two new operational concepts, uh, one of which nests within the other, the Joint Operational Access Concept and the Air-Sea Battle Concept. The the JOAC, the Joint Operational Access Concept, is unclassified. Uh, The ASBC is still classified. Um, But in reality, what they aim to do is um, disperse US forces throughout the region, um, hence uh, increasing their presence in Australia, um, Guam and Hawaii. Uh, 
which has the primary benefit of moving many US forces out of missile range uh, of some of the Chinese missiles, but also the secondary benefit, and perhaps most importantly for the US, of uh, complicating the Chinese uh, ability to track and uh, therefore intercept any US uh, lines of communication from these bases towards Chinese waters or in the near abroad. Um, these are designed to complicate China's uh, what's known as anti-access area denial capabilities, which are those military capabilities that are designed to prevent arrival entering or operating freely within a certain theatre of operations. So submarines, anti-ship missiles, fast attack craft, um, even anti-satellite weapons. Um, in reality, the pivot in, in uh, combination with JOAC and the ASBC is not necessarily a, a major military uh, development in terms of capabilities deployed, but it is a major diplomatic one because it's aimed at building closer ties to uh, countries in the region. Sending Marines to Australia, for instance, demonstrates a commitment to Australia that wasn't there before. So it's reassuring allies in the region that the US is still there uh, and will play a, a pivotal role in the region. But it's also sending a, a discreet message to China that um, it's actually moving US forces away from the front line with China, and therefore this is meant to be perceived as a defensive rather than an offensive move. The US is not uh, eager to be involved in any conflict with China currently. Um, it would be expensive. It would be um, expensive in both blood uh, and treasure uh, and not really in anyone's interests. Um, whether that is clearly perceived within Beijing is, a, is another matter, but certainly the US does not want its allies being emboldened by its engagement uh, and therefore drawn into a reckless conflict. It's notable, for instance, that during the Scarborough Reef standoff in April uh, to May this year, uh, the standoff really started because the Philippines sent its flagship uh, to the region before any maritime paramilitary vessels. That flagship <coughs> is a U.S. Donate, donated cutter, which therefore implicitly ties the U.S. into a standoff it didn't really want to be in. Uh, and that's one of the reasons the Philippines lacked regional support uh, over the Scarborough Reef standoff at the time. So what we're seeing certainly is uh, a shift in the regional order already. Um, the U.S. pivot is for the first time really adding a note of bilateral and direct military competition between the US and China, uh, which didn't previously exist. Even if the, um, the pivot is limited in its uh, deployments, it's not limited in its rhetoric. The ASBC, by its very nature, would require the US to launch offensive operations deep in Chinese territory to deal with um, the uh, anti-access area denial capabilities on land, which is an extremely escalatory response um, and is attempted to deter China um, uh, rather than actually go to war with China. Um, so while it might be premature to call it an arms race, there are military competitions between various states within the region. Um, but I would also argue there's no current desire for conflict, as we've just discussed with the US and its pivot, but also the fact that um, countries that are disputing these areas in the South China Sea are usually using maritime paramilitary vessels to do so. Uh, this is done because it's seen as less escalatory and less offensive. Uh, often it's very difficult to control ships out at sea when communications can be quite difficult. Um, so not having large guns and missiles on board makes it much more difficult to start a war you didn't want. Um, but also maritime paramilitaries uh, allow a state to affect de facto sovereignty uh, over a particular area, even if there is no de jure sovereignty. Um, it allows China to say, for instance... Uh, we must uh, own or at least have exclusive economic rights over these waters because we're policing them. Why would we bother policing them if they weren't ours? Um, it's not really a very strong legal argument, um, but it's quite a useful rhetorical one. Um, even though there's not going to be any conflict, the South China Sea disputes still matter uh, very much, not just because of the strategic significance of the sea itself, um, but because, uh, and not because they are a game changer in themselves, but because they reflect the changing game in Asia currently and uh, the future of the game in Asia for the 21st century. Um, I will very briefly, uh, if I may, just sketch out three possible future scenarios uh, in the South China Sea. Um, and I've given them relatively pithy titles uh, to make them easier to remember and probably easier to say. And the first one is um, what I would call Nobody's Sea, um, which involves um, both China and the US to some extent um, withdrawing from the South China Sea um, because the US has withdrawn some of its forces further away from the Chinese um, coastline uh, and is unwilling to engage fully to the extent that Southeast Asian countries do owing to budgetary austerity. But at the same time, China does not have the military or diplomatic forces in this scenario to fully affect a regional hegemony. Um, the upshot of this scenario would be a, a relatively tense situation, but one in which um, there would be a less likelihood of conflict um, than might otherwise be the case. Um, 
The second scenario might be called uh, somebody see, uh, whereby either the US or China are able to affect full hegemony over the sea itself, uh, and therefore over the littoral states in Southeast Asia. Um, this could be owing to a military defeat, or it could be owing to um, domestic crises that lead to a withdrawal or a, a downgrading of military capability. Um, and this would probably be in the most stable scenario, even though it would be the least um, desired from a Southeast Asian perspective, because it would be the one in which they have the least agency. And finally, there's a possibility of uh, it being everybody's sea. That is to say, it's a continuation of the status quo. There's a level of managed mistrust. The Southeast Asians encourage greater U.S. engagement, which the U.S. follows up with to a certain extent, but China continues to challenge that engagement um, and challenge U.S. principles of freedom of navigation um, as perceived from Washington. Uh, and this scenario, which is probably the most likely, um, is also arguably uh, the least stable because it is the one that has the greatest possibility for uh, unnecessary or undesired clashes um, that lead into some form of escalation afterwards. Uh, I don't want to end on a pessimistic note, um, but it's, uh, it's probably uh, the likelihood that we are currently seeing. Thank you.